The species known as the Yauchua have many stories of their great hunts, traveling to distant worlds in the far reaches of space to hunt the ultimate prey. Throughout different periods in time, mankind has been the main target for the predators. This video will be a one-hour compilation of previous topics I've covered over the years. The predator has been shown in comic books, novels, video games, and film, each one telling a different story of a specific hunter. It will include many stories like the skinned predators that were cut from the movie Aliens vs. Predator Requiem, how a predator can hunt underwater, the ancient beings known as Drukathi, which are known to be the only species the predators have ever feared, a few stories about various female predators in the comic books, a half-breed predator warrior that became a legend, and many other topics. As usual, the timestamps are below. Leave a like on the video if you want to see more stories about predator lore. Now, let's get started. What if a pred alien was using predator technology? What's up everyone, Carlos here. So I wanted to cover two scenes that never made it into the final version of this movie, Alien vs. Predator Requiem. Now when it comes to deleted scenes, they are sometimes reinserted into the film for the unrated or director's cut version, as a way of explaining a story with more content that was cut from the theatrical version. And in some cases, these deleted scenes are never reinserted due to production costs, or perhaps a change to the script, or some other reason. But one deleted scene was pretty interesting. After the Pred Alien was born, it would go on to kill some hunters on the ship, then as it crashes, it would continue to skin their bodies and hang them upside down before it escapes into the nearby town and enters the sewers. But then later on, Wolf Predator comes to Earth and reaches the crashed ship. He comes across the skinned bodies of the two predators who were killed. They were hung upside down and their feet were attached by some type of alien resin. And below them, he would find their weapons. This idea was later used in the AVP Requiem Premium Trading Cards which gave information about the characters and the scenes in the movie. The Pred Alien was supposed to skin other victims as a way of showing it still carried that memory which was part of the predator hunting rituals. This deleted scene was never reinserted back into the movie, but some production stills of this scene can be found in the book by Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. The book was called AVPR Inside the Monster Shop. There was even some information indicating that the Pred Alien was even going to use a predator technology like the wrist blades, plasma caster, and the stealth camouflage, but this idea was later removed. Now, although these two scenes did not make it into the film, I actually thought the idea of skin predators sounded pretty cool. It would have given the Pred Alien a closer connection to its predator bloodline instead of just having the mandibles and dreadlocks. But, as for the idea of seeing it use predator technology, I did not like that one because that would make it look less like an animal. So what did you think about these two ideas in AVP Requiem? Would you have liked to see them in the movie? Let me know in the comments section. Can Predators Hunt Underwater? Since most of the stories around a predator's hunt takes place on land, it got me thinking, how would a predator deal with other strong creatures in the ocean? Well, there was a story about a predator ship that fell into the ocean off the coast of Chile. A fishing crew was seen in the area and they reported seeing something. Then this transmission and its coordinates get picked up by a special task force led by Captain Cromarty. They are aware of the predator species and they even built a tracking device that will home in on the predator's biomask. They discovered the mask communicates with their plasma weapons by using an electromagnetic frequency. This is how they will track the predator. They are sent in right away and their goal is to retrieve its technology. They are given a two-day start on their mission until the CIA, the Coast Guard, and others reach the area. We then see a predator underwater about to battle a giant squid. He stabs it with his spear weapon and then the squid wraps a tentacle around its leg. But the predator pulls out his wrist blade and tears the tentacle apart. He continues to stab it with a spear and then rips apart more of its tentacles. This giant squid proved to be no match for this experienced hunter. Now at this point, Captain Cromarty and his men are dropped off in the ocean and meet up with a boat that plans to take them to the location of the ship underwater. The ship's captain named Isabel then meets the team of Captain Cromarty, Cooter, Matterson, Tangai, Bram, 
and Agent Grinnell. The team is aware that the Predator stealth technology does not work underwater, so they are sure they will not get ambushed easily. They dive into the water and locate the Predator ship. They see an underwater volcano which keeps the area warm. Some large electric eels are seen by the team, and also a dead giant squid. As the team passes by its corpse, the Predator comes out from the squid's body and stabs one of the divers with its wrist blades. He takes a harpoon weapon from them and uses it on another diver. The team rushes to get out of the water while the Predator swims away. The team gets back on the ship to assess the problem. They realized the Predator knew they were nearby, so it hid inside the carcass of a dead giant squid. But the team still had the tracking device, and the Predator was stationary near an island. They dive back in and recover Agent Cooter's body. But they believe Agent Madison is still alive. As one agent said, he saw the Predator drag him off. It turns out that this hunter is very experienced in the water, and he knows that it's human nature to rescue captured people. So they all agree to go back into the water together to search for Madison, but this time, Isabel will join them as she's an experienced cave diver. During this dive, they come across a strange species known as microfauna, but they have grown to an abnormal size. The team finds a small hole that leads to an underwater cave. So they split up into two groups. While one team guards the exit, the other looks for Madison. Then one of the microfauna creatures finds Madison, but the predator kills it to keep him alive, using him as bait for his team to rescue him. The predator takes off his bow mask and places it on Madison, so his team will track the wrong target. Meanwhile, the predator uses another breathing device as he moves around invisible to their radar. One team locates Madison and realizes the predator knew he was being tracked by his bow mask, so he left it behind. The predator grabs one of the agents with a noose and cuts his head off, while the other agent dives underwater, only to find their exit is now blocked off. The predator goes in after him and kills him in the water. At this point, the remaining survivors locate Madison in the cave, but they are attacked by a giant worm. They use their weapons to fight it off and escape further into the cave, only for them to run into the predator. Then the giant worm comes from the water and attacks the predator. He tries to fight it off, but the worm swallows him whole. As the humans try to escape, the predator uses a spear weapon to cut himself through the worm and is freed. But the worm is still alive, so the predator uses a weapon and the explosion rips off a piece of the worm. He assumes the worm is dead. The Predator continues its hunt for the humans and is attacked by one of them. Cromarty hits the Predator's biomask with a rock which knocks it off his face. Then they have a melee duel with Cromarty using a knife to injure the Predator, but he misses. The Predator then cuts his shoulder with the use of his wrist blades. Isabel then grabs a gun and shoots the Predator. This Predator suffers a few injuries, but then the giant worm is seen from the water. It was not dead. It reaches for the Predator and pulls him underwater. The Predator is not seen again. His previous injuries must have weakened him too much to fight back at this point. The story ends with Captain Cromarty and Isabel finding Madison and Bram are still alive. They escape the cave and then Cromarty resigns from his position while his report indicates that their current method of intercepting Predators will only result in more lost lives. Their procedures need to be redone to ensure future successful missions. Can Predators Use Human Weapons? Now here's a different topic I have not covered yet. Now there have been some stories about human characters using Predator technology, and it's been displayed mostly in the comic books and in the movies a little bit. The concept of human Predators was accepted by most of the fans, but what if we turned that idea around? What kind of reception would we get from the fans if we saw Predators using human technology? Well, in the comic books, there was a story about a predator landing on Earth, and when his ship was taken by the local army, he sets out to hunt humans in the area. The predator makes his way to a nearby town and is attacked by some soldiers. He kills them off and later on gets a hold of a rifle weapon. It is then shown to make adjustments to the weapon, possibly turning the safety switch off so it is armed. As a soldier named Corrales is scouting the area, he comes across the predator and the hunter fires the rifle weapon upon him. After this incident, the hunter goes back to using its shoulder cannon weapon. So it's a very rare thing to occur in the comic books, and this idea was once again used in the arcade game of Alien vs Predator, where any of the two hunters could pick up human weapons and use them. This would include things like throwing knives, grenades, pulse rifle, flamethrower, grenade launcher, and the smart gun. Now for myself, I do not like the idea of seeing Predators use human weapons. 
It's weird because I don't like this idea, but I'm okay with seeing the humans use predator armor and weapons. I guess for myself, it's because I'm more of a predator fan and I want to see their technology more often. Now in the same story, there's also a scene of a predator using the head of a victim and throwing it at a driver. It's another rare thing to see, but once again, this is coming from the comic books, where they have explored on a lot of things we don't see in the movies. What have humans learned when they captured a predator? Throughout the different sources, there have been a few times when the humans would try to study a captured predator. But what did those tests involve and what was the outcome? Did we learn anything about their biology, intelligence, and technology? Well, let's find out. In the video game Predator Concrete Jungle, Hunter Borgia would lead an organization that was built upon the Predator blood and technology. At an early age, Hunter Borgia was a sick child, but when he was exposed to Scarface's blood, it granted his body the strength it needed to survive. It also gave him an extended lifespan, which allowed him to retain his youth while he aged. As time passed by, Hunter Borgia would study the creatures and learned they were hunters, and he used their technology to create his own weapons. When they would come back to Earth, he would capture them and vampirize their blood for himself. And over the years, he learned that the predators are just animals with habits, and in habit lies vulnerability. The same concept was used in the comic book called Alien vs Predator Eternal. A man named Gideon Soon Lee ran a company who would employ special mercenaries to hunt down the predators on his behalf. Mr. Lee admitted to being 38 years old, but for the last 700 years. The predator blood would extend his life so he could live longer. During the early story of this comic book, Mr. Lee was on the brink of death until a predator ship had crashed nearby. He saw this as an opportunity. Their technology was then reverse engineered to make similar weapons that humans could use. And of course, Mr. Lee would use his team to cover up any secrets about him. Now in another comic book about Machiko Noguchi, a group of predators arrived on the planet Ryushi to hunt. A clan leader known as Broken Tusk or Dashande was injured by a human who saw them, and in the process, their ship gets destroyed. The clan then decides to take revenge on the humans. Dashande's body is later found by humans, and so they bring his body to their base. Dashande is placed in medical care while his wounds are healing. The group overlooking his recovery would then go on to discover some things about this species. The predators breathe a mixture of methane along with traces of other common elements. The humans would also learn that these creatures would bring an impressive arsenal of weapons, some things that would be used during a hunt or an invasion. These predators would also return to a specific planet to hunt numerous times, as the Rhynth hide was seen attached to a weapon. Now, in the video game from 2001, Aliens vs Predator 2, the main predator of the story is named Prince. After he was captured, the scientists who were looking at his biomask had a theory. The markings on his biomask matched those from the Zeta site, possibly indicating he was an elite hunter, or maybe even a prince of a royal bloodline, considering how one predator in the story would bow down before him. An examination of the hunting spear weapon was also conducted. At first, the scientists thought it was made up of a magnetically suspended monofilament, but when they cannot figure out what the spear is made up of, they later learn that the blades on the spear are strong enough to cut through steel. The scientists also conducted a test on another captured predator. When they tried to remove the wrist gauntlet from its arm, it resulted in the predator dying. Their society seems to prefer its warriors to die instead of being disarmed. Now, in the comic book called Predator Captive, one subject was taken alive and his arm was amputated before it could activate the self-destruct bomb. While the gauntlet and arm were kept in a container, they feared any tampering with the device would set off the bomb, and so they focused their attention on the captured predator. It was kept inside a biodome that simulated the climate and environment the predator was used to. Tyler Stern was trying to make contact with these creatures, to learn from them, communicate with them, from one intelligent species to another. He wanted to unlock the secrets of their biology and physiology. Now at first, they gave it livestock, but it did not seem interesting, and so they relied on giving it something more lively. 
humans were sent in as sacrifices. The predator would stalk them and kill them, and Mr. Stern would document everything about their behavior. But one thing he overlooked was that this alien creature was a hunter. It knew how to remain patient. It later on tested the security measures around the biodome, and it secretly planned a way to escape somehow. It even faked its own death somehow to lure the security team inside. And after wiping them all out, Mr. Stern decided to go inside, and he brought with them the Predator Wrist Gauntlet. The ending shows that no matter what, this Predator was not going to let the humans keep his technology. The self-destruct bomb was activated and it wiped out the base and also all the evidence. This Predator proved to be patient and intelligent in its approach. So that covers a bunch of information that's come up when humans had captured a Predator and done some testing. The Cracked Tusk Predator was featured in the comic books of Predator Life and Death. The story starts off with the crew aboard the Hasdrubal ship. They reach the planet LV-797, which was scheduled for colonization and terraformation. It was one of many planets already claimed by William Yutani. There was suspicion that a rival company had sent in unlicensed prospectors to strip the planet of any assets, and so a team was sent in to investigate and prosecute anyone involved in illegal activities. When the Marines reach the planet also known as Tartarus, they have no idea that a predator hunting party is already stationed here. One group of Marines uncover a wrecked lander, which was hit by some type of energy weapon, and amongst the rubble, a survivor is found, Lawrence Good. He was part of a team that came to strip the planet of anything they could find. He seems to have been struck by fear when he tells them that this place belongs to someone else. He is then taken back to base and interrogated. The same group of Marines later come across an engineer spacecraft. As they get closer to investigate, they come under attack by predators who are guarding the ship. The Marines start to shoot in all directions. Some predator blood appears on the local vegetation. It seems they hit something. But before they can organize a new plan, Crack Tusk appears and kills a Marine named Garland. This hunter goes invisible and is then aided by the Hive Wars predator that carries a large scythe weapon. Back at base, some new survivors show up to join the Marines and they explain, these hunters were here before any humans landed on the planet. Their crew were led by Captain Humble and Melville. They came across the engineer spacecraft and their team was also slaughtered. Then a second team of marines is sent in to check on the first team that went missing, but they get ambushed by the Hive Wars Predator. He kills a few humans, but is then chased down by Rucker and killed off. As the other predators show up, so do the rest of the marines. A battle breaks out with the marines having the advantage in numbers. Another predator gets killed, so they flee into the jungle and escape with any wounded hunters. The marines are then split into two groups. One approaches on foot, and the other through a dropship. But as the ship gets closer to the site, Crack Tusk jumps onto the dropship and destroys the stabilizers, forcing them to land. Meanwhile, the group on foot gets ambushed by another group of predators. Crack Tusk then pulls a marine out of the cockpit, but is injured by gunfire. He alone was defending the entrance to the ship. He recovers and then makes his way inside the ship and awaits to ambush the marines as they enter. He realizes the marines were using a ground team with motion trackers to distract them outside. So he contacts the other hunters to join him at the juggernaut ship. The humans take control of the ship and it takes off, but not before Crack Tusk appears and attacks them, ripping the head and spinal cord off one human, then using it as a weapon. He puts his attention on another human. He tries to attack with its wrist blades, but he misses and ends up stabbing a sarcophagus and gets stuck. Unable to fight back, he is then killed off with a pulse rifle. Although his story ends here, the marines controlling the ship now have a new threat to deal with. The gunfire upon the sarcophagus has awakened a dormant engineer, which leads to another story. The Crack Tush Predator was a toy figure by the Kenner Company, and a new updated version was later made by NECA. Even though he was known as an elder predator, he chose to stay on the battlefield to lead a hunting party into combat. He was also a survival specialist that endured some harsh environments, like the lava deserts on Yatra Prime and the cold climate on Fiorina and Rim. Before his death, he also had a reputation of leading his hunting party on missions, coming back victorious and keeping every member alive. One member of his hunting party was the renegade predator, who was affiliated with the jungle hunter clan. 
Renegade would sometimes join them on hunts, hoping he would claim his first Xenomorph trophy with them. Predators. Fearless hunters with advanced technology. A species that hunts for honor and status amongst their clan. While the Predators were known by many as the ultimate hunters in the galaxy, there is another alien species that was rarely known, and they were even feared by the Yauchua. During the Rage War trilogy story, which included three novels, some details are mentioned by an elder Predator who goes by the name of Kalakta, highly regarded as one of the oldest members amongst the Yauchua species. Being thousands of years old, he had a vast amount of knowledge from many hunts. One of his stories included a new alien species that were at war with the Yauchua. They were an unidentified alien species. During the story of the third novel, Alien vs. Predator Armageddon, they were named the Drukathi. Kalakta mentions that this alien species was more ancient than humans, xenomorphs, and predators. They possessed technology that was much more advanced from humans and predators. He also mentions that the Drukathi might be trying to control events on different worlds, and possibly even influencing current events amongst different species. One theory was that they were trying to control mankind's rise, to limit their reach in the stars, to make sure that humans do not become too advanced. Some information in the novels would later say that they came across Xenomorph XX121. They took an interest in the species and started to breed them and use them for their own agenda. The Drukathi's physical features were described as they look like dog people, only big. They had four legs and two thin arms with a very distinct shape of their cranium. Something very different about their technology is what was used to build it. While the Predator ship appeared very technological, the Drukadi's vessel seemed to be more organic in appearance. Somehow, their ship was grown biologically instead of using mechanical means. It was also larger than a juggernaut ship. This gives more reason to believe that the Drukadi had a vast amount of knowledge in biotechnology. The Drukadi were believed to be millions of years old. During a mining expedition on LV-178, the Drukathi were discovered within some ruins. A derelict ship that crashed on LV-178 was apparently a xenomorph breeding facility, but the aliens got loose and wiped out the crew. The damage to the ship was most likely some sort of high caliber weapon. The ship would then lay untouched for thousands of years, buried within the sandstorm of the planet. Upon being discovered by miners, they would later come across Drukathi xenomorphs but they are found within a mummified status. This could resemble suspended animation. The humans who found them had first believed that they were just statues, but they were really in a state of hibernation. But later on, they were awakened and attacked the miners. This xenomorph variant was almost 12 feet in length, but also was stronger and larger than the human-born xenomorphs. It also moved at all fours, just like the Drukathi, but they were trapped within their ship when explosives sealed the exits. The concept of the Drukathi were mentioned vaguely in the first and second novel of the Rage War trilogy, but by the third novel, their importance in the story started to unfold. The original concept was, what if an alien species managed to control the xenomorphs and use them as a weapon? It was a combination of the control that Will and Yutani wanted with the xenomorphs and the mystery behind the Yachua species. When coming up with the story around the Drukathi, Tim Leben was told to not include the engineers. He intended the Drukathi to be dog aliens. They were an ancient civilization, and even though they were gone, they left something of themselves behind. While the information around the Drukathi was limited, I did like the idea of having another species that was above the predators. If you want to read up on the Drukathi, they were mentioned in a few novels like Alien Out of the Shadows, Predator Incursion, Alien Invasion, and Alien vs. Predator Armageddon. What is the Enforcer Predator? This hunter came to Earth in search of a bad blood, a rogue Yauchua that was known to hunt their own kind, a ruthless, dishonorable hunter. This Enforcer Predator was on a mission to end the killing spree of the bad blood. Now when humans found a crashed ship full of dead predators killed by the bad blood, the Enforcer was nearby, but as the ship exploded, he was injured but he continued with his mission, only to find the bad blood attacking a team of special forces. Now when the Enforcer Predator intervened, he was shot by the humans and suffered some injuries. 
The surviving humans were unaware of what was going on until they realized this creature did not have any reason to fight them. It left them in search of the bad blood who escaped during the battle. This was the perfect time to attend to his injuries, pulling out the bullets and mending his wounds. Meanwhile, the bad blood was relentless. It went on to massacre another team of humans in the woods. The enforcer would later find the bad blood and they would battle, both of them armed with different weapons. But the majority of the battle would be around melee combat. The enforcer would use his trusty combi stick and the bad blood would use a bone sword they would be equally matched, each one suffering injuries from the other. Now when it seemed the enforcer was about to win, he stabbed the bad blood in the arm with its wrist blades. Victory was close, until another team of special forces would shoot at the enforcer predator. This would distract them to where the bad blood would rip the enforcer's biomask off and stab him in the chest with it. Because of these humans, the enforcer would fail in his mission. Right before he died, he gave a tracking device to a human named Mandy. It would lead them to his pod, which the Bad Blood was planning to use to escape the planet. The Bad Blood was eventually killed in the end by a human. Although the Enforcer was close to victory, because of the humans, it died. Now this predator could be seen as the police force of the Yautwa species, or even, as far as saying, they could be bounty hunters but are deployed for special missions. The Predator universe is full of many stories across various sources like comic books, novels, movies, and video games. You can find a vast amount of lore about male predators from young bloods, seasoned hunters, and elders. But what about female predators? These Yauchua hunters are very few, but they do exist. In the novel called Predator Turnabout, a game warden by the name of Sloan is scouring the Alaskan land, looking for poachers. When he comes across the body of a bear, he assumes the greedy hunters have once again invaded his countryside, but he was wrong. The bear was killed by something else, something not from this world. It was a predator, and now the hunter has become the hunted. By the end of the story, Sloan and his wife survive a battle against another predator but their story does not end there. The Predator anthology novel called Predator If It Bleeds included 16 new stories, and the one called Rematch would bring back Sloan for another story, but this time he is hunted by two predators, a male and a female. Around nine years after the incident in Alaska, Sloan has now grown old, and along with his wife Mary, they live a quiet life in the Oregon forest. While they think their encounter with the Predator is over, little do they know that they are being hunted once more. A male Predator by the name of Nakande and his female mate named Bagauti are now on Earth, and they are looking for the man named Sloan to avenge the death of the fallen Predator in the previous story. When the two Predators locate Sloan and his wife, they assume Sloan's old age has withered his hunting spirit, but instead they decide to search for other prey. Even though Sloan has grown slower and weaker, it does not mean his hunting skills were affected, something the Predators will learn later in the story. Nakande says, This old man is not worthy of a hunt. The trophy would be meaningless. We traveled across the galaxy for this Uman. He is not the warrior we learned about. But Vagauti reminds him, This man defeated one of our brothers. Do not underestimate him. And so, the two alien hunters look for other prey. To prepare themselves. They end up taking out some bikers growing a meth lab. The gunfire alerts Sloan that the alien hunters are back. Nakande says, little sport here, just target practice. Vagauti responds with, they were inept, but they were what was available for now. Hoping that Sloan still has some of his former skill, they both agree to then look for Sloan, the sniper. But Nakande still doubts that Sloan is worthy prey, saying that he is not scared by a mere story. He boasts of the time when he defeated a Kiande Amida in single combat, and an old Uman is easy prey for him. As Sloan and Mary make their way to the biker's location, they bring along some firearms and ghillie suits. They set up a sniper point and wait. As time passes by slowly, Sloan mentions his eyes have not faded over time. 
He knows the alien hunters have stealth camouflage, but he knows what to look for. Before they know it, Nakande ends up getting shot in the lungs and is then unable to continue on. Before he dies, he regrets underestimating Sloane. His old age has sapped his speed and strength, but not his skill. Vagouti mourns her fallen mate, but just for a moment. She then disables his self-destruct device, so she has time to hunt the Umans herself. Later on, the local deputy named Mac is also investigating the deaths of the bikers. He comes across Sloane and Mary in the woods, and they explain something is hunting them. Vagouti locates the Uman's vehicles and disables them with her wrist blades. She then hides in the trees, patient and waiting for her prey. All the Yaucha before her had failed in hunting Sloane. She would not make the same mistake. The old Uman and her mate were no less deadly than the stories she heard, and now her plan was to kill them quickly. While she waited for them at another location, she identifies a new target helping Sloane. A vehicle is then brought in to help Sloane escape. Vagouti decides to kill them all when they enter the car. When Sloane fakes himself entering the car, he aims and fires towards a large branch that could support the weight of the predator. Sloane's shot hits something for sure, and then he hears the sound of something hitting the ground. Sloane rushes in and pulls out his revolver, firing at Vagouti's body some more. Her body was smaller and thinner than the last predator. They realized it was a female. Vagouti activates her self-destruct device and then dies but Sloane and the others manage to escape the blast radius and survive. And this ends the story of Vagouti, the female predator. The female predator, known as Sister Midnight, was in a story about the darkness, witchblade, aliens, and predator. During a story about Sarah Pizzini, who was in possession of the witchblade, she was part of an undercover mission, only to find the xenomorphs had started to appear on Earth. It was soon after that they were both attacked by the female predator, Sister Midnight, who seemed to target only Sarah. Jackie pulls her away and saves her life, then uses the darkness to attack Sister Midnight. The predator escapes by creating a hole in the ground, and as Jackie and Sarah follow her, they are led to a lair of alien eggs. This was in fact only a nightmare of what was to happen in the future, and as they both awaken, they realize they were captured by Kenneth Irons, the arch nemesis of Sarah Pezzini. They both later on escape, but find themselves aboard a spacecraft which is orbiting Earth, and it also carries a cargo of xenomorphs. Sister Midnight had also appeared on the space station, and upon meeting Sarah, she finds herself drawn to the Witchblade's power. She originally came here to stop the xenomorph infestation, but her predator comrades were killed by the automated defenses. She alone survived. Some time later, one of Jackie's darklings would wander off and comes into contact with a facehugger, which creates the Dark Alien, a xenomorph with features of a darkling and the powers of the darkness. It proved to be too difficult to kill, so they had to trap it in the airlock. Then Sister Midnight returns and challenges Sarah by removing her plasma caster weapon. But Jackie picks it up and tries to shoot at the Predator, but she disappears upon activating her stealth camouflage. Sister Midnight would later return to save Jackie and Sarah from the Dark Alien, who is now consumed by the darkness. She is able to absorb the Witchblade into her right arm, and in doing so, it grants her unimaginable strength and newfound powers. She stabs the Dark Alien with great force, and it explodes, but in doing so, Sister Midnight suffers some severe injuries. The Witchblade is then returned to Sarah, and as Sister Midnight lays down, Sarah would activate the self-destruct device on her wrist computer, granting her an honorable death. Her mission was now complete. The Xenomorph infestation was stopped. As Jackie and Sarah escape in a ship, the spacecraft which housed the aliens is seen exploding in the distance. Female predators are rare in Yauchua stories, and although the majority of the hunts have been mostly dominated by males, there is one female predator that has a deep story. She was linked to a person named Karen Delacroix, who was genetically engineered to be a trophy wife of Lucien Delacroix. Her home was aboard the Liberté Skyliner ship, which was meant to be a city in the sky, and it was used to escape the alien infestation on Earth. 
It was maintained by the artificial intelligence computer mainframe named Toy. Karen also has the ability to change her appearance in order to continue pleasing her husband. Throughout her time here, Karen suffers from nightmares of a predator hunting her and it seems to call her by a different name, Ash Parnell. At some point, she gets abducted by the predator and it hunts her in a jungle on a planet full of xenomorphs. The predator fights off the xenomorphs and is then captured by humans and taken aboard the ship. Karen would later search the ship and freeze the predator she called Big Mama. They would land on a planet and then use the predator's ship to fly further away. Big Mama would then train Karen in the ways of a Yauchua, treating her as if she was her own kind. They would later come across a space station and Karen gets captured by people who plan to sell her on the black market. Later on, a queen alien is then found on the space station, and as Big Mama awakens from her resting period of healing her injuries, she battles some humans that boarded her ship, only to come into contact with xenomorphs and gets captured. Karen would then join a team of mercenaries that were trained in the Yauchua ways. Together, they would follow the queen who was holding Maria and Big Mama hostage, and to save them both, Karen sacrifices herself to become the next host to one of her eggs. They would later go on to battle the white hybrid creatures that were created by Toy. This AI tried to harness the properties of the humans, xenomorph, and predators into one species that would be deadlier than the rest. But for Karen, her fate was sealed. The chestburster erupted from her body and killed her. This gave birth to another version of a hybrid. It was later revealed that Karen was just a copy of someone named Ash Parnell. She was just a clone of a woman that Lucien Delacroix once loved. This would explain why Karen had knowledge of weapons even though she was not created for combat. The Queen Alien would later be captured by the White Hybrid King and implanted with a hybrid embryo. The King would speak in the voice of Willem de la Croix, who served as the host for this hybrid. Now the reason Big Mama referred to Karen as Ash Parnell was because the original Ash Parnell met with Big Mama long ago. This predator had her children kidnapped and Ash Parnell tried to help her. They never succeeded in this mission so they had to escape. But later on, Ash was killed, and she was then cloned and named Karen de la Croix. This would explain why Big Mama recognized Karen and called her Ash Parnell. The white hybrid king would continue to fight against Karen's alien hatchling and Big Mama. But then, an unlikely ally was found. The queen mother escapes her confines, and knowing she was going to die from a hybrid chestburster, she grabs the hybrid king from behind and holds him close as the chestburster erupts and kills them both. The hybrid that comes out is then killed off quickly. Now, since Karen was genetically modified, she also possessed the ability to regenerate, and when she comes back to life, she appears as the original Ash Parnell, and she tells Big Mama that she found her captured children. Ash would then kill off Lucien de la Croix, which in turn disables Toy. They all escape, and then Ash is labeled as the Renegade, which was her original combat name when she was working for Caleb Deschanel in another comic book story called Aliens Renegade. She was the commander of the Samara space station seen in this story. Female predators are mostly mentioned in novels and comic books. The story of the female Yauchua named Hashori takes place in the novel of Predator Incursion. It was part of the Rage War trilogy which was continued with Alien Invasion and Alien vs Predator Armageddon. Hashori was a clan leader of the Widow Clan, one of the few female predators to reach 9 feet tall. It was believed that females were larger than the males, but this is not the case with other females. It appears that Hashori was one of the few female Yauchua to grow this tall. She was also described as being a widow, which matches the clan name. There is a possibility that her clan may have practiced monogamy which led to the males taking many wives and resulting in the birth of many pups. While this is not a normal practice by the Yauchua species, it could have been exclusive to her clan. The Widow Clan are a pack of female hunters who have lost their mates in some way. Now, unlike the other predators who hunt, Hashori was unique in that she did not wear any weapons or armor. Her large body was only covered with material around the crotch area and leather straps mounted over her chest. The area around her torso had visible scars and battle wounds. 
but one noticeable feature about her face was that she had small eyes. She is also the only predator in the franchise to speak and understand English almost fluently. During the story, she is contacted by a synthetic named Lilia who is on a diplomatic mission. Lilia was part of a group of androids that found a way to control the xenomorphs. They renamed themselves the Rage. She later disagrees with their plans of genocide, so she steals their secret and runs away, trying to find someone who can stop them. Hashori takes Lilia onto her ship, the Zero Za, and ignores her message. Lilia gets tortured by the female Yauchua, using lethal chains that have alien eggs on the tips. The eggs would infect the wounds and eat the host from the inside. This results in agonizing pain for the victim. After a few days, Hashori listens to Lilia, and it turns out that she was there to help the female predators fight against the fire lizards or the fire dragons. This was a hostile species that could even make the predators flee from them. Later in the story, it is revealed that the fire lizards are actually the xenomorphs. The rage is led by Beatrix Maloney. She sends out General Alexander and a pack of xenomorphs to hunt down Lilia. They locate her on the Widow Clan ship and attack. While most of Ashori's clanmates died during this encounter, she, along with her clan member Wendigo, take Lilia and escape. She vows to take revenge, but first, she must find other predators that can help her. While their clan ship is left abandoned, two human survivors from a previous event would later find it. They check the rage vessel that was attached to the ship, and inside its logs it gives out details about their plans. The Rage have taken over a fleet of colony ships. Each one contains thousands of colonists in suspended animation. These humans will become hosts to breed more xenomorphs. The same colony ships are headed back towards human space. All of humanity is in danger. As the story progresses, Wendigo, who is also part of the Widow clan, ends up attacking some humans, but she is mortally wounded in battle. Before her self-destruct device is activated, she is killed by McMahon. Wendigo was another unique predator in her own way. While most predators are calm and silent during their hunts, she would give out wild screams and her attack methods were led by aggression and a temper. This was a different personality when compared to her hunting partner Shamana, who was calm and in control of her actions. Shamana was known to be large with long dreadlocks. By the end of the story, all the androids part of the rage are destroyed. When modified nanotech was inserted into the control center of all the androids, they all self-destruct, therefore releasing their control on the xenomorphs. Some survivors would then join Hashori on her pilgrimage to the Yauchua homeworld. Greyback, the leader of the Lost Clan seen at the end of Predator 2, also known as the Golden Angel. This predator was on Earth on two known occasions. It was first seen back in the year 1718 in the Guinea coast. During this time, it oversaw a crew of pirates led by Raphael Adolini. When his crew took money from a church, Raphael told them the gold would be returned to its owners. It is here when his crew turned their back against their former captain and decided to fight him to claim the stolen gold. Raphael was then forced to fight against his crew. Then a predator attacks one of the pirates and challenges Raphael to a duel. While Raphael was a skilled swordsman, he was able to stand his ground against the predator. But when the rest of the pirates come after the gold, both Raphael and the predator fought together to kill off the pirates. When the battle ended, only the predator and Raphael stood alive. They were about to continue their duel when one remaining pirate shot Raphael in the back. The predator kills this pirate before he escapes with the gold. Then with his dying breath, Raphael offers the predator his pistol and says, Take it. And as a sign of respect during combat, the predator leaves his sword where Raphael is left to rest. He then leaves the planet. The second time this predator was seen on Earth was in 1997. After the city hunter was killed by Mike Harrigan in their ship, this predator appeared along with its hunting party. Now with centuries of experience in hunting, this predator was now older, wiser, and led the lost predator clan. He appeared only to order his clan to claim the body of the city hunter as they planned to leave the planet. But as Greyback walks away from Harrigan, he turns back and gives him the flintlock pistol he acquired in 1718 from Raphael Adolini. As part of the Yauchua Code of Honor, you must respect another warrior's victory over a predator by granting them a gift. As Mike Harrigan receives a flintlock pistol, it is considered an honor 
to receive an item from a time long ago. So the story of Greyback tells us of how during his younger years, he was an honorable and skilled hunter, one of the few predators to stay alive during its recorded hunts, and also one of the very few to have ascended in the ranks of the predator hierarchy to become an elder and command his own ship of predators. Now, Greyback's targeting lasers were seen to be mounted on its plasma caster weapon instead of its biomask. In the novel of Predator 2, it is shown that Greyback is the one who kills the city hunter by beheading it after it's too weakened to fight back. The pistol he gives to Harrigan also has a slight difference in the novel. It dates back to 1640, where the film dates it back to 1715. Now, some sources have said that Greyback had some dog tags and a patch from the 2nd Infantry Division. If this is true, that would mean Greyback had a third hunt on Earth, but the details of this event are unknown. The Guardian Predator was seen at the end of the movie Predator 2. When Mike Harrigan defeated the City Hunter in combat, the other Yautua showed up along with their leader, Greyback. Instead of attacking Harrigan, they picked up the body of the City Hunter and left to prepare in leaving Earth. Right before Greyback leaves, he gives Harrigan a flintlock pistol for defeating a Predator in combat. This hunter was one of many members of the Lost Predator Hunting Party that came to Los Angeles in 1997. Although most of them have very little information about themselves, it seems the Guardian Predator's mask was originally going to be used on the jungle hunter in Predator. But then, early on in production, this mask was replaced with the classic Predator biomask. However, this design was then borrowed and enhanced for future Predators. Celtic, from the 2004 movie, Alien vs. Predator had a biomask which is heavily inspired by the Guardian Predator's biomask, and then Celtic's mask was then used again for Scarface in the video game Predator Concrete Jungle. Now the Guardian Predator is part of the Lost Predator Hunting Party, and a few members of this clan do have a backstory to them. For example, we have the City Hunter, who appeared in the comic books with Dutch Schaefer's brother, and we also have Greyback, the leader, who has an early story on Earth back in the year 1718. Now, the other members don't have a story, but there is some small information listed about them. The boar predator was seen in the movie without any weapons, not even any wrist blades. Now, it was linked to the Losk Borg predator only in the sense that one of the toy companies used boar's mask on the body of the Lost Borg predator. Now, the hippie predator went by this name due to its very long dreadlocks. He appeared with a spear item in his hand, but it did not appear to be a combi stick weapon. It's possibly an item used in their rituals, which is why it's also known by the name of the Shaman Predator. Then we have the Ram Predator, also known as the Warrior Predator. Although his mask has a unique design, he is also seen to have blue coloring on its skin. We also have the Scout Predator, who had a similar mask design of the original Jungle Hunter. It is believed that the Jungle Hunter's costume was used as a base for the other Predators with minor changes. Now there was a Predator featured in the Call of Duty Ghost video game, and although it was meant to be based off the Jungle Hunter, it had some elements that resembled the Scout Predator. Another member of this clan is the Snake Predator, who is given this name due to the markings on its skin. Although the markings on its head have more distinct patterns, it resembles what you can see on a snake. The Borg Predator had the most unique armor in this clan. Its armor had a futuristic look to it. It was named the Borg Predator because of its similarity to the Borg enemy in the Star Trek franchise. And the last member is the Stalker Predator. Like the other Predators before him, he has no story, but is only separated by the minor changes in its mask design. Although its mask looks similar to the Boar Predator, it was also known as Baby Boar and the Brother Boar. Now the toy figure of this Predator from NECA actually had an additional item. It had a pendant that had the same design of his mask. Predators, a hunter race from far away. Savage, brutal and intelligent. They possess technology that surpasses what humans have, making them the ultimate hunter. The predators are born to become warriors in combat, to hunt the strongest prey they can find. While they might seem barbaric in the eyes of others, these hunters follow a strict honor code within their society. Each predator is bound to the law of the hunt to have equal footing to the prey they seek. But what happens when that code is broken. It was a long time ago when the story of Nightstorm was born, a super predator who defied the laws of the hunt. A hunter who was once a strong, skilled warrior 
full of potential and knowledge, one who would lead the next generation of predators. He spent countless years to become a master of the hunt, to be respected by his peers and elders. But on one day, he threw it all away for the sake of his own glory. He went against the code of honor to walk his own path. He made his own rules in hunting, using forbidden tactics and weapons, hunting anyone, anything, and in any way he wanted. He gave up the code of honor to hunt by his own rules. He became the first super predator to defy what the elders had taught him. Seen as a heretic or traitor, his teachings spread to others who would follow his ways. This would start the beginning of a civil war between tribes, a bloody battle that would continue eons into the history of the predator species. One side chose to keep their honor, while the others sided with Nightstorm. These super predators were then branded as enemies. As time passed by, the story of Nightstorm was never forgotten. While he was gone, his teachings still remained with those that followed his ways. However, not every student of him was as evil. Meet the descendant of Nightstorm. This is the story of the scavenge predator. But what's unique about him is that he is a half-breed, part Yauchua and part super predator. He was raised in a small Yauchua village during his younger years. He would later prefer a more nomadic lifestyle, and he has no official clan affiliation. Scavage is a direct descendant of the ancient elder Nightstorm. As a way to pay tribute to his great powerful ancestor, Scavage would forge his armor and weapons with a similar design, but instead of using gold, he would use the warrior's steel. Now, here's where things get very interesting. While he is a descendant of Nightstorm, the super predator who started the civil war, Scavage does not follow the exact same path as Nightstorm. Scavage lives by the Yauchua Honor Code. However, because of his silent nature and his deep respect for Nightstorm, the other hunters around him would get into heated discussions about him. Scavage would spend most of his time alone, showing no interest in dealing with others. He will only follow those he greatly respects, such as the Cracked Tusk Predator. While he is mostly a lone hunter, Scavage is known to bring his hound on hunts. It's the only living creature he can truly trust. Another hunter that is linked to Scavage is the Renegade Predator. He is a young, brash, new blood Yauchua with promise and vigor. He is part of the Jungle Hunter clan on Earth, the ones that took part in the event in Valverde from 1987. While Renegade is seen as motivated and headstrong, he tends to rush ahead of the other hunters in his tribe. He is seeking the thrill of being the first member to kill a target during that hunt. On some occasions, he would be seen to hunt with Crack Tusk's tribe. He would study the old master as an apprentice, learning his ways and applying those methods to his own set of skills. The elder would also help the young hunter develop his unique hunting weapons. Both the renegade and scavage are linked to the Cracked Tusk Predator. There's been some times when Renegade struggles to cooperate with Scavage. This is because the Jungle Hunter clan sees Nightstorm as a devil. Scavage looks up to Nightstorm, but does not follow his teachings. This tends to cause tensions between them, but Scavage has proven he follows the honor code. Throughout his many off-world hunts, Renegade has built up a considerable amount of kills. However, this new blood still seeks his first Xenomorph Trophy. He hungers for battle, honor, and to rise within the ranks. Despite his thoughts about Scavage, he knows that remaining with this tribe is his best chance at achieving his goal. So, this video was meant to focus on the Scavage Predator, but since he had ties to other hunters, I felt it was more appropriate that I include how each of them connect to each other. If you want more details about the legendary Nightstorm Super Predator, I will leave a link to that video. Scavage was originally from the Kenner Toy Products in the early 1990s. Some models were repainted and released as another series, but it's really the same Predator with a new color. The toy company we know as NECA would later revive many of Kenner's alien and Predator characters, 
Scavage was one of them, and at the same time, he was given a story on the backside of the packaging. Some predators will be copies of other versions, but recolored or given small design changes. Because Scavage was a descendant of Nightstorm, I can see why they look similar. Hunter Borgia was the main villain in Predator Concrete Jungle. He was the CEO of Borgia Industries and the son of Bruno and Isabella Borgia. His father Bruno was born in an alleyway in Nui City and grew up very poor. As he got older, he made his money by betting on himself through illegal dogfights. This led to him receiving a scar on his face and losing one of his eyes. Over time, Bruno started to rise up the ranks of the underworld. He got to a point where he would be able to bribe the chief of police, O'Brien. He would later marry Isabella and she became pregnant. In 1930, a lone predator named Scarface was on a killing spree in Nui City. It was simply called the Nui Devil. While Bruno's gang would have a war with the Irish mob, this led Scarface to him. Determined to be the god of gangsters, Bruno stood his ground in a museum. While his wife went into labor in a church, he fought against the predator Scarface, but lost the battle. Scarface would rip Bruno's head off and brought it to Isabella. As she held her newborn son, Hunter, she realized he was a sick child and he was going to die. But Isabella used her son as a decoy and pulled out a pistol and shot Scarface in his left eye. His blood splattered on both of them and then he fled the area. But as Scarface ran away, he left behind some predator technology. This was later picked up by Isabella. Scarface would be picked up by his clan and was banished to a planet for 100 years, all because he failed his mission and survived his self-destruct bomb. Isabella would later learn that the blood of the predator had unique properties. It retained her youth for an extended period of time. She would age slower and live a longer life. And as for Hunter, he was able to become stronger and survive his young age. Together, they would form Borgia Industries and would rebuild the destroyed city. As time passed by, they would reverse engineer the Yauchua technology for their own weapons. They also created soldiers known as the Monster Squad to fight against the predators. When the Yaucha would return, Borgia Industries would be ready. As Isabella got older, she would become the biological computer known as Mother. It controlled all the electronics of Borgia Industries. She lured the predators to Neonopolis by controlling the weather system. Hunter and Isabella knew they needed more predator blood to extend their lifespan, so they vampirized any captured predators. Isabella even said, only their lifeblood can keep us alive but some captured predators were kept alive to be transformed into cybernetic predators. Hunter would later have a daughter named Lucretia, and when she got older, he gave her more control of his company. Even though Lucretia wanted to sell the company and leave the city, Hunter refused to do so. Meanwhile, he would travel the world, hunting big game as he found more stories on predators. At some point, Hunter came across the xenomorphs and gave them to his mother Isabella as a gift. She kept them alive to be studied, but also planned to use them later on. As Hunter reached his 100th birthday, he still retained his youth. He became fascinated with the Yauchua species and started to spend a lot of time inside an isolation tank. He was trying to fuse predator and human DNA together to create a more powerful being. Then, in the year 2030, Scarface would return to reclaim his honor by slaying those who stole his technology. As he made his way through the city, he was eventually captured by a number of Monster Squad soldiers. Hunter Borgia would show up to see Scarface taken away to a lab. When he assumed the predator threat was over, Hunter went back to his isolation tank to continue his work. But Scarface would break free and run through the facility, killing everyone and freeing other younger Yauchwas in the process. While Lucretia became very concerned for her life, she ran to the isolation tank where her father was. She stopped the genetic augmentation process prematurely. Hunter would emerge much different. He became what he was so obsessed with. He was now a human predator hybrid. He used armor and weapons stolen from the Dark Blade clan, while branding a predator skull on his left shoulder. Hunter became more aggressive and lacked the self-control he had as a human. He attacked his daughter Lucretia, but her Ronin bodyguards tried to avenge her. Hunter would flee the area and battle Scarface on top of a statue. Even with his altered genetics, Hunter was defeated by Scarface. But before the battle was over, Scarface would play back something Isabella said to him. Mighty Bruno Borgia fathered a stunting weakling, but you made him strong. This meant that the blood of Scarface is what made Hunter strong and kept him alive so long. Hunter was not strong enough on his own. At this point, 
Scarface pulls out his wrist blades and kills Hunter Borgia. With his mission complete, he reclaims his honor and joins his clan once again. Before the story ends, we get a glimpse of the current Mr. Wayland who bought out Borgia Industries. They also show us the new host chosen as a new biological hard drive for Mother. It was Lucretia. It was even mentioned that Hunter Borgia was friends with Charles Bishop Wayland before he disappeared. This was referring to Mr. Wayland that was in the 2004 movie Aliens vs. Predator. Hunter Borgia was a very interesting villain for this game. He was calm, intelligent, and strategic when he would capture predators. Throughout the story, you could tell he spent a lot of time learning about their hunting patterns and methods. His fascination towards the Yautruist species is what pushed him to want to become stronger than them. But one thing I'm left wondering is how strong he would have become if Lucretia did not stop his genetic augmentation process prematurely. And that's the end of Hunter Borgia's story in Predator Concrete Jungle. It's one of the few characters that I know of that has a close connection to the Predator of that story. If you made it this far into the video, we have reached the end. This concludes another one hour video about Predator lore and history. There are many other stories I will bring up for future videos. These longer sessions will give new fans a chance to catch up on my older videos. Thank you so much for watching. This is Acid Glow and I will see you in the next video.